first and foremost, relationship with your God, with your maker, with your own personal faith is important. And then in that, you find yourself. Relationship with yourself was like, to me, one of the most impactful things that I could learn in my life. I grew up playing the victim mentality, man. I told you I come from a broken home. I, my, I didn't tell you about my dad's side. I, first memories of my dad is meeting him in prison. He didn't graduate high school. Alcoholic died when I was 25, man. All right. Hey guys, uh, today I got the apartment ninja warrior. And we're going to be talking about asset management and he's going to be giving us, you know, a master class on that and other things that he does. He has a military background and we're going to be talking about uh, multifamily. So Ivan, how you doing today? Doing outstanding, Julian. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm excited, man. Thank you, Ivan. Um, so I really want to get to know a little bit about your upbringing and, and how that has impacted you where you are now. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, man, honestly, I wasn't. I didn't have much as a kid growing up. Um, my mom did the best she could, you know. Uh, my parents were divorced, but my mom, she owned a little grocery store uh, mm -hmm. growing up. And uh, she uh, made me work in this grocery store. Yeah. And off the floor, uh, count the cans up in Oregon. We count cans for money, right? Yeah. Was, um, I hated it at the time, but I learned a lot about this hard work, discipline, and really in my mom's story, having a dream and going after a dream. Uh, this little history about my mom, she uh, grew up in the aftermath of the Korean War. I'm half Korean. And so yeah. she didn't have the opportunity to go to school, came to the U.S., made something of herself, always wanted to own her own business. And in her mid-40s, started her own uh, business and owned this grocery store for 27 years wow. and had a, a tremendous impact in the community. And really what I, what I gained from this experience watching my mom is how she was able to impact the community with a little grocery store in a little neighborhood. So much so that when uh, the kids grew up, when she first started running the store and they would move away, they would still come back and uh, buy things for my mom, support her, see my mom, and even bring their grandkids back. So today, uh, uh, this a little bit about me, I, I own apartments. So I am now using that same model and asking myself, not only how I can make an impact at the apartment level, the apartment community level, but how can I use my apartment to make an impact in the surrounding community like my mom did with her grocery store? That is amazing. I love your your mission. That That's so great. And uh, tell us a little bit about, did you get started in multifamily or or did you do something and then gradually get into? Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of the story there, man. So I don't know what it was like for you going to college for me. Uh, I went to the Air Force Academy and they always told us that, listen, when you retire, you need to make sure you invest in the stock market so you have a nice nest egg for you once you retire. And so I'm like, fine, I'll do that. Uh, I had a small loan given to me back then and had a low interest rate. My plan was to put all the money in the stock market mm -hmm. and the stock market was earning 10, 12% and I would keep the difference. Great way to get started, right? Kind of made sense. Well, I put all this money in a fund and literally the fund went zero overnight and I was devastated. You're devastated. I said, there's got to be a better way to make your hard earned money work for you versus you work for it. And that's when I get, got started to learn about another way to invest. I started learning about real estate. So fast forward, I was getting relocated down to Texas and I was just staying with my mother-in-law at the time. My wife was pregnant with her first, our first child. And my mother-in-law said, Hey, I remember you said something about wanting to get involved in real estate, own real estate. She said, there's this lady going through a divorce down the street. She really needs to sell her house. Um, maybe she should go down there and see if she'd want to sell you her house. I said, okay. I literally dropped everything. I was moving into the, her house at the time, dropped everything, went down, knocked on the door said, uh, Hey, you know, I'm Ivan. I heard that you want to sell your house. She said, I, I do. I said, how much? She said 33,000. I said, sold. And I bought that house for 30,000 bucks. I ended up renting it for about eight fifty. got about $300, um, cash flow per month. I said, oh my gosh, I made more money in this deal than I did in that previous deal in the stock market, there is something to this real estate game. And that's when the dream of owning real estate was birthed inside of me. And I went on to buy a bunch of single family houses and uh, started building up a single family portfolio. So I got my first state start in real estate investing, investing in single family homes. Dude, that's a, that's impressive. It, it, it sounds like you really got into it one after, right after you saw that $300 a month cash flow check. Um, so tell us, you know, after you got into single family, what was your vision? Because you could have stayed in single family and obviously you're not. So what was it that got you to 
get into multifamily? Making a lot of mistakes. And now, uh, <laughs> so first house was a home run. My second house was not. I overpaid for this house, over rehabbed it, tanked me. I was eighty thousand dollars in now in the hole, credit card debt, had a brand new baby, and uh, a reluctant wife. <laughs> yeah, but she she hung on. So still still happy to be married to her. But you know, um, I uh, I was driving back from Dallas to Abilene, Texas, listening to AM radio, um, and in the backdrop drowning in my woes of losing all this money and and i was like golly where did i go wrong i did really well in my first deal not so good in my second i don't know why i was listening to am radio but i heard this mentorship program about real estate called lifestyles unlimited hosted by dale walmsley and stephen davis and they said we have this two-day mentorship program in las Colinas, texas dallas texas come check it out i was like honey i gotta go to this thing i gotta learn where i made all these mistakes i went to this two-day event first day was all about single family second day was about multi-family and I was like, oh my gosh, I've been all wrong. And uh, the idea of multifamily has birthed in me at that mentorship program. The thing is, I didn't have the belief. I didn't have a mindset. Uh, I made very little money and I'm in debt. I had this idea that I don't have money. So I continue to not have money and continue to stay in debt. So I really had to work on myself. And in that time frame, I stayed in a single family until I thought I was ready to move over to multifamily. And I ended up getting about 30 houses. A single family. Uh, I got my real estate license as a broker to make money on the side because I was in the Air Force this whole time flying airplanes. And uh, a lot of good opportunity came to me. I sold 99 houses in two years and made all this money and went and bought all these houses. Wow. And then uh, and then around 2016, I said, oh, uh, the market's drying up a single family. Maybe now's the time to jump into multifamily. Uh, joined another mentorship group down in Dallas and went all in, dude. Went all in. And that's one of the lessons. Just go all in. Commit. And really realized that I had what it takes the whole time. I just didn't believe in myself. Nine months into it, we had a first deal in multifamily, three property portfolio, uh, 99 unit, 50 and a 65, 214 units total. Wow. That's when we got our first deal in 2016. Uh, fast forward, now we've been doing multifamily for about seven, seven and a half years. Uh, quite a roughly 3,000 doors, about 19 buildings, sold 14. And, uh, raised around 90 million bucks on doing this and it's completely changed my life, revolutionized my life, uh, gave me a new purpose uh, where not only you know, helping people passively invest in real estate so they can achieve their dreams, but also I'm helping people learn how to do what I did, focus on asset management and operations. That is impressive. I'm, I'm really glad that we're speaking to you today. And when it comes to asset management, what, what is it that you do or, or teach that makes it different for the person who's getting into it to be successful? Absolutely, man. Um, I think what I teach is, is first of all, I provide a leadership model to it. Uh, I really don't like the term asset management. I like the term asset leadership. Mm -hmm. That term right there, asset leadership, the framework changes, the perspective changes, your approach. Mm -hmm. It's about influencing, uh, empowering people. It's about getting people to take ownership of processes. Really, asset management is about those processes. The process manages the entire uh, system overall. But I've developed this framework of teams, tools, tactics, and roadmap. And I then implement this overall system that I've coined the term the ninja operating system because uh, I am the apartment ninja warrior after all. So um, <laughs> really, so first, you got to have the best teams, man. If you don't have the best teams, you don't have the best people. You can have the best processes. If you don't have the right people implementing those processes, what's the point? I mean, you got to lead those people. You're not, you're taking ownership of the entire leadership team, property management company, general contractors, lawyers, CPA, everybody. You're taking ownership. You're the leader. The buck stops with you. The buck stops with you. So I'm putting on this framework and approaching it from a leadership standpoint. It's not micromanagement. It's getting people to take ownership of the process and making people better as a result and holding myself to the same standard. It is about tools. A physician has certain tools to operate on a human body. A contractor has certain tools to operate on buildings or real estate buildings. Uh, same with as an operator, you got to have specific tools and we develop our own proprietary tools to help us operate properties in a very efficient manner. And then it's about tactics. Tactics are the plays, the playbook. Uh, and one of the key things that I teach is looking into the future. And understanding this term called exposure, 
or vacancy exposure, anything that can cause exposure, evictions, NTV, skits, loss to lease, and managing your exposure. I believe a lot of asset managers, leaders, if you will, are reactive. I'm teaching a proactive model so that you're never in a bottleneck situation where you don't have enough units available. Uh, you are not meeting your projected numbers um, and you don't have people taking control of the processes. So it's really about foretelling the future and implementing that. And then roadmap. Roadmap definitely comes in in the rehab process. And I don't believe, you know, I think a lot of people buy real estate and they don't realize that you actually have to implement a construction plan. And honestly, like hiring a construction, um, a property management company, they're really good at doing that, but I'm not about fire and forget. You still got to own the process. You're the one that's responsible to make sure you have unit deliveries in a timely and orderly fashion. It's like you're setting up a production line, like say a Toyota factory, where you have cars running through. Well, those cars are those units and you have to deliver those units in a certain timeline and within a certain uh, budget. And if you don't, again, your business plan fails. Your first year in owning the property is the most critical year. And there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of opportunities for failure. And I think a lot of people underestimate from an operational perspective what it takes to actually correctly execute a business plan. Execution involves people and processes. And a lot of the financial models does not focus on that. So what I do is I start with the operational model, the operational strategy, we back that into a financial model. And especially when it comes to understanding economic vacancy in that first year, the economic vacancy is broken down between a lot of components, loss to lease, vacancy loss, bad debt, and so on and so forth. But that vacancy loss is a controllable measure. You can control vacancy loss by having the right processes. So I developed this roadmap, this exact roadmap through a rehab project that play by play by play, step by step by step, a process and a process that works so that you can minimize your vacancy loss so that you can actually produce the numbers that you say you're going to produce on a performa and so you know how to actually articulate that. And what's the net result? And I'll end on this and we can go to your next point as I uh, continue to talk here. But what's the net result? The net result is going to buy better deals. You're going to have better returns on your investment. The net result is this, is that you're going to be able to optimize your portfolio and produce the cash flow in the time that you hold your investors, you're going to produce it. The net result is that you're going to be able to raise more capital effectively because you truly understand the operational risks at hand and you can articulate to your investor. You identify those risks, but you articulate how you're going to mitigate those risks by an operational strategy and system and plan. And I don't see a lot of people talking about that. I don't see a lot of people understanding that. And I can't make this up because I've done it. I've lived it. So it's real. It's inside of me. I know what's on the other side of that coin, man. I know it's on the other side of owning properties. And I just got to be transparent. It's not what everyone makes it out to be. It's buying it is so sexy. It's so cool. You put it on Facebook, Instagram, look at me until you freaking step into that property and realize what you got yourself into. And so I'm here to help you truly understand what's on the other side. So you can truly underwrite your model to accurately reflect what you're going to encounter. And you already have a plan in place where you're not sidetracked. You're not diverting from your original plan. You're not having to pivot too much because you've already determine the exact strategy that you're going to use overall. I am impressed. It, it, it's amazing. And I don't think a lot of people do talk about asset leadership as you coined it. it it's really an awesome perspective on it. And it, it's really interesting. And so what kind of experience did you go through or to get to this part of your process? Great question, man. I told you I went to the Air Force Academy. I always yeah. wanted to be a pilot. I flew B-1 bombers for 20 years in the Air Force. Not only that, you know, I, I was involved in multiple projects, multiple organizations, involved a lot of operations and oversaw a lot of processes. My last gig in the Air Force was, uh, I was a functional check pilot and they would take planes into a hangar, tear them apart, refurbish them, put them back together. And I was the pilot that went out and test them out with the crew. And I was intimately in the, well, not entering, but I was involved and I understood and I saw how they operated on this plane. And I was involved in these meetings called rapid improvement exercises where they break down every single node. They would have a play. The guy would take the wrench, turn it here, crank it this way. The plane would go from this bay to that bay. They're going to do this part, this part, this part on a, operate on certain parts on each step along the way. I was like, this is a very systematic orderly process. And 
uh, time is money. One second. It's that FEMA thing. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Sorry about that. I live in Oklahoma and they're testing. Uh, that was a little crazy. Testing. Uh, I just got the national uh, alert too. That's, you got it the same thing? Oh, maybe it's a nationwide thing, man. I thought it was going to happen at 2.30. Now it's, I guess not. Uh, anyhow, it's all good. Shake it up. Let's go. You ready? So, yeah, I'm talking about the hangar. I'm watching how they operate on this plane in the hangar. And that gave me the model to produce my interior unit improvement plan. So I can spit out units in a timely fashion, correctly, on time, best quality, best price. And so that's just one example, right? And if you look at the military, I mean, you can have your opinion about military and all these things, fine. But it's an operation and they operate all over the world. And they have centralized leadership control at one base with people doing things all over the world. Well, why can't we take that same idea in apartments? You have a centralized hub of control. You have multiple cells, properties all over the world. You have a leadership structure operating on properties all over the, not world, I should say, nation, US, right? Yeah. And so that's where I get a lot of my thinking, my, a lot of operational experience. I've been doing that for 20 years and I see a lot of gaps in this business and I see a lot of opportunity for improvement. And therein lies why I'm, I'm here today and helping people uh, implement those, pro first understand them, understand where the gaps are, implement those processes to create efficiencies so that we literally can operate anywhere in the US. That, that's amazing. I, I really uh, honor that you served in, in the Air Force. And I do know that a lot of the people who are the most successful have some military background. So given that this is where you come from, it does make sense that you have a systematic approach to things, which obviously gives you an edge. So, so, uh, th that, that is impressive. And this Ninja warrior, uh, name you, you gave yourself is, is this part of a uh, something bigger? Do you do some of those Ninja warrior, uh, you know, I have, my own, uh, I have my own academy, part of Ninja warrior Academy, and I teach people the framework, the Ninja operating system framework that it uses this executive leadership timeline. That it's about ex it's about executing with excellence, right? It's about implementing solid strategies. It's not about shooting from the hip anymore. These things are predictable. It's people and processes. So, like, would you like to have a proven playbook to help you optimize? And it's designed for people who are just coming into this business. Designed it if you've been in the business for a while and you want to improve your operations and fine tune your operations, right? Um. And it's even designed for those people that want to understand uh, who are in capital raising, say just more on capital raising, because think about it. You're the one that are putting your money in a deal. You don't, you don't have to operate the deal, but you sure better understand what the risks and how to overcome those risks and what makes a deal a good deal. So this is designed to help you raise even more money as a capital raiser. Yeah. Yeah. That is impressive. So let, let's talk about, um, if we can, can we talk about some of the things that maybe you, you, you can share that okay. allow someone to really have success at asset leadership? Yeah, let's do it. Like some, some of the tactics, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. so this roadmap you, in planning, operational planning, operational strategy, you always start with the end in mind and then you got to build backwards. And everything you do points to that end goal. What's the end goal in, in uh, apartment operations? Cash flow. Not per year, per month. You should understand what your net cash flow is going to be. It's there on the operational budget. If you don't understand the operational budget, then therein lies opportunity for learning, in which I teach. The operational budget is what the property management company puts together. But you should understand how to build that yourself. Net cash flow at the very bottom. Then you back in your CapEx, your debt, Asset manager fees, get to NOI, operational expenses, top line revenue. So everything you do needs to produce a net cash flow, which then ties to your performa. That net cash flow should be above, at or above your performance because you want to over -prom um, under promise and over deliver. So as a strategy, we always say the net cash flow should be higher than what you told your investors. You got a little buffer. And then 
you got to be able to plan and put together entire pieces and exactly how you're going to create that net cash flow. Expenses are expenses. Labor is labor, insurance is insurance, tax is taxes. You got R and M in there. You got um, you got R and M. You got general um, administrative stuff, and then you got uh, R and M. You got make written. Okay, but in your first year, typically a lot of your rehab and everything is capex, so that's planning. Um, and then you have um, your top line piece. A lot of what I focus is on the top line piece. And what is your system and process to be able to truly understand what units you're going to rehab and how, uh, what units you're going to rehab, when you're going to rehab them, and what type of rent bumps you're going to get. So what we do is, once you're on your property, you pull a lease expiration report. Lease expiration report. Lease expiration report tells you exactly when every single lease is going to expire in sequential order. A rent roll goes by unit number, and you have to sort the rent roll 1 through 100, not necessarily per date, what you have a lease exp expiration report, you can sort it by date. So we're in October, all the leases are going to come up due in October, November, December. Well, then it has uh, in place rent rate. Well, guess what? To the right of that, you could put market rent rate on an as is condition. To the right of that, then you could put performer rent rate on renovated condition. And then you could put your cost to rehab next to that materials and labor, which is a lot these days. And then you evaluate what is your true ROI and your ability to effectively execute that up upon that. And then what you do is you look at what your rent bump is as is, because there may be in place loss to leaks, you're in a growing market, what your in place rent bump as is, or what your rent bump is per performa. And what I think a lot of people do is they analyze current rent to performa rent but the current rent may be below market rent. So you may be, say, for example, current rent to market as is condition, say, 100 bucks below market. And then, but if you upgrade to a renovated condition, you may achieve another $100. So that's, say, $200 from its current condition. Is your rent bump $200? Or is your rent bump $100? Wouldn't you rather keep that tenant in place and achieve a $100 rent bump versus? Take them out, rehab the unit, and deal with the downtime it takes to rehab that unit. And what if you don't rehab that unit in timely fashion, or it takes longer than you expected to get that unit rented? So <clears throat> your actual rent bump, possible rent bump, is only $100, not $200, because you're below market already as is. Oh, let's play this out. What if you cannot effectively rent that unit in a timely fashion and get it leased up? Because you poorly picked when you're going to do that. Or there's a lot of other reasons why. And that unit sits there for one month, two months. Say on average, the rent rate in a Dallas property is 1200 bucks. Two months, that unit sits there. You lost $2,400 vacancy loss. Mm -hmm. You could have achieved a $100 rent bump by keeping it in place. Or you can bump it, trade out $200. Okay. Say $100, a, d a real rent bump you're going to get, call it true rent bump, and you lost $2,400. How long is it going to take to make up for that $2,400 loss? 24 months. Yeah. What was the freaking point? <laughs> I've taken that unit offline. It sits there. You go through this whole renovation process, and you don't get it leased up in time because of the inefficiency of the property management company. And you only got a hundred, uh, a true rent bump of a hundred dollars. And now you have to make up for all that time of lost rent of the vacancy loss. Well, guess what happens though? That's, that's just one unit. What if you, you think you have confidence in your contract or you didn't correctly assess them. You say, I'm going to give you 10 units. And that happens times 10, $2,400 times 10, $24,000. You can lose in just two months of having that unit sit offline going through the rehab process. That's a lot of freaking money. That's a huge impact to your bottom line NOI, and it, and it screws up your business plan. All these people are chasing rent bumps, and they think rent bump, rent bump, rent, economic loss, because I'm a financial, I look at things from a financial standpoint. They did not assess what it takes to achieve that rent bump and what your true rent bump is, and what all of the what is the execution risk at stake, all the things that go wrong, all the moving parts are involved in implementing operation to get a net effect of 
24, uh, $2,400 loss. So you just lost money, let alone the money you had to spend to get that unit ready. So we look at things from an execution standpoint and truly understand execution and execution risk and su your plausible su success rate of truly achieving a rent ball. Now, if you have affect the team, affect the process, okay? And say you can trade out that unit in one month, like move out, move it, you know, move out, rehab, move in within one month. Now you're chicken butt. So I teach, don't drop your physical down in the 80s where you're draining the property. Keep it out above 90 and just rehab those units up here and looking into the future now using this expirate, uh, lease expiration report I told you about. It's stacked and unit by unit by unit that's going to expire in the future. You can analyze in those columns I've told you just in this discussion to the right what your true ROI is on each of your uh, units based upon true rent bump. And then you can identify exactly what units you're going to rehab. It's a known quantity. Schedule it out, put it on paper, and that's the plan. Now you know exactly what you're going to rent and you can uh, tell your tenants you're not going to renew them. You got to tell them 60 days in advance, typically in most markets um, in, in cities, whatnot. Got to have 60 day notice. Tell them we're not going to renew. We're going to come in and we're going to execute. We're going to execute, execute, execute. And a lot of people, that's that's a huge problem. We can't execute because they don't know how to lead. They don't know how to manage. They don't know how to put in processes. They don't know how to pick the right people. They don't know how to like oversee the thing. And they don't understand the overall ins and outs process that goes on with the property. And so that's planning. I went through the whole planning phase. Now there's this roadblock phase, this unknowns. You know, when you buy a property, there's a, a lot of hidden gremlins. Gremlins is the term from the 1980s. I grew up watching gremlins. I'm an older guy. Maybe you don't know. We can talk about that offline. It's a movie with all these crazy little gremlin dudes. So these little gremlin dudes, look it up. It's in these properties are hidden. It's in the, or you call them skeletons. Let's call them skeletons. These little skeletons, these bodies, dead bodies are buried everywhere. That comes in the form of delinquency. People don't truly understand the impact of delinquency on their property. And they're now looking at those financials and seeing where delinquency is hiding. You got to go on the balance sheet. It's somewhere in there, man. It's hiding. And there may be a huge delinquency problem on your property. And if you're buying a property in today's market in class C, most likely is. We're all going through delinquency issues. We're all, evictions are high. Court systems are backed up. Inherently, rents are low. You got to understand that operationally. You got to see this delinquency problem. And if there's a delinquency problem, there's going to be future evictions. But evictions, you don't know because the uncertainty of courts. There's a... You don't know exactly when the judge is going to say yes or no. The judge might say no, go back to your go back to your apartment and live there for another 30 days, then come back. There's all this uncertainty. Sooner or later, those evictions are going to happen or those tenants are going to get off property and then now there's huge vacuum. It's called exposure, vacancy exposure. And now, and now you got a problem because you didn't foresee this and you have all these tenants off property. The physical drops back down and you don't have this rehab machine up and running and you're trying to catch up. And by the way, your maintainers are over here scrambling because there's just dealing with make readies and work orders and doing the normal day-to-day -day business. And now you have to bring in a third-party construction team. And now you're behind the power curve and you have all this vacancy loss hitting the books every month. So I'm teaching you to look into the future. I'm teaching you to prevent that problem from happening. Happening, And a lot of people are not going to know that because they don't have the experience. And I don't want you to experience that type of experience. That screws up your business plan. So those are a lot of the roadblocks, a lot of the unknowns. You got to be able to foretell and foresee and prevent those from happening and put in mitigation fact, mitigation plans, mitigate those risks. Okay. And then you execute. This is where leadership comes in. You get people to take ownership up the line, down the line. I'm always talking about up the line, down the line. Up the line is leadership up top. Down the line is the people at the ground level of rehabbing the property. And then you track it. I got my own tracking system. I got my own proprietary tools to be able to track everything. And then you pivot on the when you're looking at the data and you pivot and you implement, re-implement, and you say, oh, a little course correction, course correction, course correction. Now we're going to move this way, move on, and push the property down the line, man. And that's a little bit about how I do things here in the Apartment Ninja Warrior Academy. As we go way in depth. <laughs> I, I gave you about the 10-minute version, but that's what it looks like here in the Academy. Hopefully that's some tactical uh, advice for your listeners to be able to use, implement in their properties. Yeah, yeah, it really is. I'd never heard someone speak about asset leadership the way that you did. So definitely appreciate you. And, you know, when it comes to 
kind of the way that you have systems and processes in your life, what are the systems and processes that you have in your life that are just so that your life can run, that you can share with us? Gotcha. Man, uh, I'm on, on my morning. I, I have the saying, win your morning, win your day. Yeah. I get up, I make my bed. If I make my bed, I've already accomplished something. Um, I do 25 push-ups. <laughs> get them out of the way, man. All the way down. Don't don't bend your back. All the way down. Touch your chest to the ground. All the way up. I mean, it's like, and I get up early. Five o'clock. Five o'clock. Win the morning. Nobody's up in the morning, too, so like, you feel like you own the morning. I don't know, man. You want to get in the weeds? I drink lemon juice. Uh, and then I <laughs> get out my system. Drink some tea, then I go into my own personal affirmations, meditations. I write my goals down and I visualize and embody it. I vibrate it, man. I'm all about this stuff. You law of attraction. I read it. I'm I practice it daily and I see it happening in my life, man. I had nothing, dude. I was in the hole eighty thousand dollars and I was running at five in the morning, losing weight back in the day down to Texas. I pointed to Texas and said, Someday I'm gonna apartments in Dallas, Texas. I'm eighty thousand dollars in debt. I have no money. Fast forward ten years later, I bought seven hundred units, three apartments back to back, massive apartments. 165, 110, and then like 200 unit prop property to pass B. This stuff works, man. So I just, I win my morning every day. And it's really about clearing yourself out. Man, and clearing yourself out is like practicing gratitude and thankfulness and uh, really making that a discipline in your life. And once you do that, then you are in a good energetic state because you're going to go out into society and you're going to make an impact. We're all called to make impacts. We're all here to make a difference. We're all here to, we got a job to do. So I want to make sure I'm right before I get out in, in the world. And last thing, I go to the gym, man. I burn, I burn my butt off here in about one hour in the gym, get the weights in, get the crutches in, get some cardio in. And then I go, uh, go to my day, dude, uh, and, and get after it. Wow. I'm really, uh, impressed with the way you have everything in. I can tell that you do have some energy that you emanate that is different from other people. It, it, hey. it's like a shining beacon. Yeah. So, so that that's lovely. Um, I'm glad that you're talking about that because, um, some, some folks don't talk about this and, and that is kind of like the oil that makes the machine work. So, so it's really cool. Um, do you have some tips or advice when it comes to having a relationship that fulfills you? so that you can accomplish what you want as a, as a leader in your business? Man, I was, I would say, uh, you know, we're relation first of all, most relationship with your God, with your maker, um, with your own personal faith is important. And then in that you find yourself relationship with yourself. is like, to me, the, one of the most impactful things that I could learn in my life. I grew up playing the victim mentality, man. I told you I come from a broken home. I, my, I didn't tell you about my dad's side. I, first memories of my dad is meeting him in prison. He didn't graduate high school. Alcoholic died when I was 25, man. Talking about the identity issues I had growing up. A lot of self-doubt, a lot of poor image kind of stuff. I didn't realize I had the power to change it by the power of my thought and then rewriting my story. I had to get my relationship right with myself. I had to get it right with myself. And once I got that right, and it wasn't even until like later on in life, man, I struggled, honestly, all these years, I struggled. I had to, I had to really, really, really take time, take a time out, rewrite my story and see myself from a, a better perspective, a better light, and then, and then move forward. And so relationship with this, your maker, your God, your self-worth, your everything stems from that place. And then you can align yourself with that. And then once you have that alignment personally and you accept yourself, it's three A's. Approve yourself, affirm yourself, and accept yourself. You know, as a man, you know, and a lady, you know, affirmation is important, you know, and, you know, I didn't get it from my dad growing up, so I had to go out and, you know, I found it in a lot of different ways. I honestly, I turned to success. It was not healthy. I turned to success as a way to prove that I didn't need to have a father. And the, the more successful I became, the more I showed that I didn't need a, a father figure in my life. It was driven by it was driven by like my own internal hurts and, and and anger. I had to find a lot of healing in this whole journey of myself, you know. Uh, and I, and it, it manifests in really unhealthy ways. I, I finally had to like understand this thing and really get to the get to the root of it and rip it out and overcome it, right? And so I did. I overcame it, man. And it's still a constant nurturing process. It doesn't always always completely go away because you can't change the fact that I didn't have a father. He's not here anymore. 
but I, st I know how to overcome it. I have tools to be able to do that. And I know how to rewrite my story. I know how to change my perspective because I have the power of thought and I can come up with new ideas, new thoughts, new perspectives. And I can ask for other people's insights and perspectives and align with those if it's in alignment with who I am overall, right? And so um, that then moving forward, you're not attached to anyone or anything. You don't have to assume anything from anyone. You don't have to expect anything from anyone. And therefore, you're no longer offended or impacted by anything in this world because you truly align with your source and who you are, then you are all powerful human being, right? And so like, you're no longer offended. You're no longer hurt. Maybe get a little agitated here and there, but man, the recover time is like minimal because you got a purpose, man. You got a, you got a vision, you got a, you got a goal in your life, you know? And like, why, like, do you want this little thing to take you down when you've already known you've decided with visceral conviction and who you are visceral, man? Like it's certain it's like, there's no, there's like a zero or one, you know, zero, you're dead one. This is your thing. Like, that's where I'm at. This is my thing. And so this is my thing, you know? And like, nothing's going to come in the way of that thing. You know, I was talking to my wife last night. I was like, man, I'm still playing spout, dude. Like, I'm still not playing big. I got to, we got to level up. We got to level up our mindset, level up in our own self-worth and identity and play at a higher level to expect higher results. So I'm going through my own personal clean, clean house process. I'm this clean house, man, getting all these ties and just clean them all out of my life. Nothing, if it's not in alignment with where I'm going in life, sorry, I love you, but you gotta go. <laughs> and I'm moving. I, I wish you well, though. And thank you so much for what you've given me. I bless you, but I got a place to be, man. I got a purpose. And so that's uh, a little bit about what's going on. <laughs> yeah, that, that is amazing what you got going on. And that that really uh, speaks to to me and, and to a lot of people, the, the fact that you had to go through this transformation to become who you are. And you mentioned that you want to even go bigger. So, so what, what is this bigger vision that you have that you want to go after? Man, Apartment Ninja War Academy, I'm, I'm convicted. I'm going to impact and empower. It's a leadership and training academy, 10,000 asset managers. I want to go after 10, I want to impact 10,000 asset managers and make them asset leaders. Yeah. That's my vision today. That's what I'm, that's what juices me, man. That is, that's awesome. And, and yes, and when it comes to these asset managers, you know, where are these people gathering? You know, where, where do you, where do you find these people and how you reach these people? You can cover a lot of ground on the internets today, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, man, I think honestly, it's like, be yourself. You know, be transparent, be yourself, put it out there and watch them come into your life. You'll attract your tribe, you know? And so for me, I'm on, you know, on social media, right? And a lot of them come through social media. I go to a lot of conferences, a lot of events, and it naturally grows that way. Mm -hmm. It grows that way. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think, Ivan, about the current landscape as it stands for multifamily do you see that there's still opportunities to find deals and are you still acquiring deals looking at deals every day getting close and closer as we uh finish off q4 of uh, 2023 absolutely dude there's always an opportunity there's always deals i see deals all the time right i have my own specific criteria it becomes more refined after every deal um but dude here's the thing there's always an opportunity in multifamily. But this is a pivotal moment that we are in. Hear me out. This is a pivotal moment that we are in, in in this industry. Prior to the rise of interest rates, we were spoiled. Let's be real. We were spoiled. You can buy a deal, screw it up, wake up tomorrow, millionaire, and move on to the next deal. And you're a hero in everyone's eyes. And you were spoiled because of cap rate compression, right? And all these natural levers that were taking up place because the Fed was doing what they were doing and Natural rent growth, blah, 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 blah. Today, we don't have that luxury. But we need to keep this industry alive. We got to keep it alive on behalf of our investors because we promised them a future. And we have a fiduciary responsibility to fulfill that promise. 
We cannot fall. This is a moment of being tested. You're in the you're in the fire and the thick of it all. And I know you're out there. I talk to you every day. I'm going through it myself. And so therefore, the future is here if we are willing to step up the plate and play ball at a higher level. So I'm the, I am growing my community of my tribe of people where we are coming to the table in a transparent transparent position we're truly open up and sharing what we are dealing with in this industry so that other people can provide solutions to your problems so that you can get the answers that you're looking for so that your deal is still alive and that you have a future in this business so that this industry can play at a higher level overall Let's not make these same mistakes that we made in the past 10, 15 years in this cycle. If we all learn to play at a higher level, we will all then benefit the rewards at a higher level. We will all win. So we have to be willing to come to the table, though. We have to be willing to put ourselves in the fire and grow into the person and improve our operations, improve our systems in order to be able to play at a higher level. And so the answer to your question is dependent upon you and me and what we're willing to do. It has nothing to do with the market. Isn't that good news? Because then you can control that. Because you can control the skills you have, the focus you have, the discipline you have, the people that you partner with. You get to control all these things. And if you get to control it, then we have a future. So the answer to the question is, yes, we have a future. Because we are the future. That's amazing. I, you couldn't have answered it better. <laughs> and I, I wanted to ask you a question about this, um, this criteria that you have. You know, for for the first time buyer multifamily, what do you see is as your ideal property for them that they can go after? I'm not messing with the class C anymore. I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people out there, you mess with the class C, and it's it, it's a challenge. But I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that experience. So I'm grateful for it. You know, leveling up the the class asset class, class B to class A, or class B to class B plus, maybe A minus in there. Um, pissed roofs, no boiler chillers, individual HVACs. Uh, obviously in that, in the eighties product, and you're not going to have aluminum wiring. You're not going to have old fuse boxes, right? You have a little bit higher, better demo, higher demographic, a higher median household income, right? At that level, you can charge a little higher rents, therefore bring in a little more sophisticated property management company and have pay a higher wages and have a good long-term leasing agent and manager. To create some lease of loss and momentum at, at your property. Obviously, great locations, the standard playbook there, right? Uh, rent growth, job growth, Midwest, Southwest, Southeast typically is good areas. But if you just become focused on one market and just own it, just own it. And then you, you, you can do well in that market. You just own it. It's a very micro business. You got to understand things from the ground level, right? But that look things from an operational perspective. Then that's the basic criteria. But then now beyond that, operationally, what has to happen for this deal to happen? And that's where I think, like, again, that's what people don't understand that. So I'm following looking at a property where the previous owner rehabbed the, all the exterior, rehabbed the parking lot, rehabbed the office. They did one third of the interiors. All we got to do is finish off the last two thirds and maybe the last 50% of, of the two thirds. If you leave some meat on the bone for the next person, I'm like, hmm, not much execution risk there. So, plausible that I could probably pull this off and make these returns happen if I have the right team and the right processes versus the property that's now like may not be a bad thing, but there's, you got to redo the exterior, redo the roofs, redo the parking lot, redo the office. You have a lot of delinquency. So your demographics, not so good. You got to kick everyone out and bring in a lot of people. Uh, make sure you bring in a property management company that's co-located and born and raised in that sub market, in my opinion, versus from a different market. Otherwise you're adding more risk, operational risk. Now there's a lot of operational risk involved. Now you may be able to pull it off because your experience, you have the right team, the right process, vertically integrated. There's a lot of factors why you most likely you're able to pull it off plausibly, you know, you have a plausible chance of it happening. But if you're a new person and you don't quite understand the process, you don't have the right team, that's a lot of risk. A lot of risk for an investor, even obviously, right? And so, you got to be able to understand operational risks and your ability to circumvent those risks and overcome those risks. 
And the last is debt. We don't talk a lot about debt, you know, a lot of what operations, operations, but debt obviously has a huge impact on your ability to be able to operate because it takes away cash flow. You know, at the end of the end of the budget, that debt has to be paid and you have net cash flow at the bottom. So you better under, as an operator, understand how the debt works and bring in a debt product that correlates with your overall business plan and make sure there's alignment there. You know, if you buy bringing a 10 year term on interest only, and you have this defeasance, yield maintenance or prepayment penalty that could impact your net re returns. Is that necessarily the right debt solution? Maybe, maybe not just depends, but in that example, I'm trying to say, if you want to hold it less than 10 years, two to five, maybe that's not the right way. Maybe it is because then people would assume the note, depending on where you are in the overall cycle. Of course, now interest rates are high. So why would they assume a high note? But previous to the cycle, the idea was people may assume the note versus get new debt. And if they assume it, then you don't pay, uh, what prepayment so, penalty, right? So. Again, there's that component as well. So gives you some insight of some of the things that we look at, but to answer your question, it's a lot of it's from an operational perspective, uh, and really got to look at it from that perspective and have your property management company, your general contractor in the middle of these conversations as you underwrite deals, or at least if you've done a lot of business with them, you know, their ability to execute and what their numbers are. But if you don't, they better be in the middle of your underwriting process. They're the ones that are going to inherit this property. They better have a clear understanding of what it is you want to execute before you buy that thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Ivan. And I, I really want to highlight, if you can, one case study from your Ninja Warrior Academy that could per portray just how much value you guys really bring, you know? Absolutely. Um, it is. Salt Lake City had a Poor demographic is in a great submarket, Salt Lake City downtown. Um, culture was paying late. The end of the month, uh, I saw cops twice, three times a week. Mm -hmm. That property round. Uh, we had some vacancy loss issues. We overcame those. Brought in my vertically integrated construction team. We uh, just had the most, the highest NOI that NOI that we've ever experienced in the past year and a half. We went from uh, we grew the NOI by sixty percent, ninety to one hundred. Five thousand or stabilize at ninety five. Delinquency at one point five percent. Come on, man, high five. Delinquency at one point five percent. That's crushing it. So there's no more bad debt, no more vacancy loss, and no more, um, if you know, no more, uh, yeah, no more bad bad debt. So it, it all hits the bottom line. The income hits to the bottom line. Eleanor, back in two thousand in Oklahoma City, the Eleanor, we bought it one hundred ten units, converted a common area into additional unit, a two bed and one bath. Rented for nine hundred dollars. We spent thirty thousand dollars to add an additional unit, and then improved the value by two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. That property had an amazing manager. Talk about lead people. Her name was Andrea. She lived on site. She lived there for twenty plus years. She did such a fine job. She had no more than five hundred dollars delinquency. No more. I never saw that thing higher. Typically, it was zero. She collected fully in the first three days every time. Talk about having the right team members. Um, we bought it for 33, sold it for 66, we realized 125% total return, holding it for five years. The biggest thing is that operationally, um, we realized we didn't have to rehab the units. We had so much in place, lost the lease. We held on to that CapEx money, had some roofing issues, swapped out some roofs instead. And again, you know, we sold it for, um, 125% return. So a couple case studies there of just implementing the major operating system and how it's actually been refined and perfected now over the years. Yeah. Yeah. That that's amazing. Um, do you still keep in touch with some of the military people that you work with and are they also getting into multifamily as part of their? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Um, my friends that I flew with <laughs> yeah, in my, my plane and talking about it after, you know, sitting around in the office and, you know, here we are investing together in multifamily. Pretty cool. That is awesome. Um, so Ivan, um, do you have any advice for young 20 something year olds to really get started in life towards the right direction? hundred percent, man. You got to know what you want. You got to have clear clarity in your life. 
truly understand what you want, not mom and dad, not what your friends, not what society wants. Know what it is you want and go on that journey to truly understand that. Once you have that and you commit to it, visceral conviction, and you give it everything. I'm the guy that cashed in the 401k, the IRA, when all my friends thought I was crazy. I went and bought real. I knew I wanted to be retired once I retired from the military, not be an airline pilot. I went against the grain in my community. I went against all the grains. But that clarity is what pulls you through that mess. That clarity of knowing your why is what pulls you through. And then you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to go for it. You got to get mentorship. You got to get mentorship, man. You got to bring coaches, all kinds of mentors. I have all kinds of coaches, all mentors, any aspect, you know, the personal side, professional side, business side, physical fitness, social media, you name it. I got someone in my life helping me every step of the way. Don't have to reinvent the wheel. And now information is a commodity, dude. It's all there. But really these coaches, these mentors, you still need people to hold you accountable. It's so easy to slip and make excuses. You got to have someone kick you in the butt every day. I'm telling you, I still do. And I'm a pretty disciplined guy. And I still have people that hold me accountable. All right. And so, but it starts with clarity, man. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. I really do. I think a lot of people don't know what it is they want or they're scared to commit to that. You know what I'm saying? Like me going from multi, from military to multi family is a huge leap. But once you know who you are, not to sound a little bit corny here and trite, but if you were a bird designed to fly, come on, man, you're going to step off that perch, and flap those wings. That's going to happen, bro. But you got to know that it's going to happen. So if you know that, you know that, you know, then you can overcome that fear and take that step. And one step at a time actually overcomes any type of fear. Step up one, you know, it's consistency in the drops that causes that bucket to spill over daily drops in the bucket. Over and over and over, just going to the gym over and over and over. You're going through it like, man, eventually it pays off. <laughs> so like every day, I'm like, God. And then eventually like, okay, got my drop in the bucket, you know? And then in that process, you become a different human being. You really do. You, If you want more, you got to grow to become more. You got to become it first. So you got to be willing to grow. And in that process, as you grow, all your dreams, all the thing that you envisioned in your life, however you envisioned it, it, it happens, good or bad. You attract the good and the bad. It happens. So know what you, it is what you want in life. Yeah. Thank you, Avid. And thank you for the podcast. Where can we find you? If our listeners want to see you more, learn from you more. Yeah, man. Check me out my Facebook group. I know you got an amazing Facebook group. Thank you so much, by the way, having me on your show. This has been amazing. But I have my own Facebook group called Apartment Ninja Warriors. Apartment Ninja Warriors. Come on board. Come inside to the family, to the team, and learn more about teams, tools, tactics, and roadmap as I help you become a better Apartment Ninja Warrior in your apartment operations. Awesome. Thank you, Ivan. I really appreciate you having here and hope to have you in the future. And... Um... Thank you for, for, for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. My pleasure.